do this. Did this a number of times. I think, how does, how does, he, do, how does he get away with this? And he, and he wouldn't deal with this and he wouldn't repent. There were some other issues and eventually we had to uh, put him out of the church. But, you know, exactly one year later, uh, I found out how it is that he gets away with it. Because two weeks ago, I got a call from a debt collector. They said, Mr. Plummer, you owe Telstra $2,600. So I began to go to war, the police, stat uh, statutory declarations, arguing with Telstra on and on. But it turned out that I was a victim of identity theft. That this man who considered himself a disciple stole my identity. How many know this morning that discipleship is not identity theft? Discipleship is not trying to walk or talk like your pastor or having, God forbid, the same haircut or the same Bible or stealing his name. Hi, you know, my name's Glenn Payne. How many know that, that, is, that is kind of weird? That's not really discipleship this morning. But we, we do understand today some uh, dimensions of discipleship. I want to consider this with you today. The scripture that we want to read, uh, there is a man who understood that if he was going to enter into the fullness of his own destiny, that it would come through, the following, uh, through following the teachings and the leadership of another man. I want to preach this morning a very practical sermon that I've called uh, Destiny Through Headship. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 6. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives... And as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets went, stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. And it was divided this way and that, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So it was when they crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And so he said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, then it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire, separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it. He cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and its horsemen, and he saw him no more, took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Amen. Amen. Destiny through headship. Let me talk firstly about the disciple. The origins of an apprentice. All of us would be aware, no doubt, of an apprentice or a tradesman. This stems back to medieval times, to the Middle Ages. And the way it worked back then was that a, a, a parents would uh, select a master craftsman. They would select a man that they were going to leave their son or their daughter in the hands of this man's family. They would take their, their child between 10 and 14 years of age and they would leave them with this craftsman, this master. The apprenticeship, the term of apprenticeship was seven years. An apprentice would be bound to the master and would live with him and his family as a member of the household. There was no pay. The pay, if you will, the compensation was food and was shelter and was training. And, and, you know, no pay. The unions would have had an absolute field day. But it was a privilege to be an apprentice. It was a privilege and this was the opportunity of a lifetime. And a typical apprentice showed many of the same qualities that we actually see in this man, Elisha. So we can look at these qualities and we can study this man's life. And if you are here this morning and you consider yourself a disciple, at any level that may be, we can have these three qualities. We can look at them and make them this morning our focus 
I want to talk firstly then, number one, that a disciple has a servant's heart. 1 Kings 19.21 is the account of the appointment of Elisha to ministry. And the Bible says of this man that he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. This word minister, you know, we think about ministry and so often we think about um, a, a, a position perhaps or, or a title, but the word actually means the menial tasks. This is where we get the, the word household from. I don't know what household chores are like. It is the ability to take care of the necessary functions of the house. And how many know so often in the house of God, the necessary functions are not that attractive. When it comes to stacking chairs or turning on PA, is the heating right? Putting out a sign, there is an awareness here. And I realize that that is incredibly practical. But this word goes further because the spirit of this is, are you looking for the necessary functions. Are you looking in any given service or any given outreach um, what is needed in this church? What is needed in my service here? Is there a gap that somehow I can fill? Because let's be honest, we all love the big gigs and we all love the thought about the big gigs, but are you aware of the menial tasks that somebody has to do? friend of mine is uh, uh, pastoring up in Queensland and he's seeing some breakthrough. He had this 25-year-old Islander guy saved, thank God, great guy. And he was telling me about one of his services. He said this guy came along and got saved. I think it was a Wednesday night. He said on the Sunday morning, here he is. It's his second service in church. He said he's sitting there in, the church, in, 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 his, in his seat. And... Um, and he said in that service, he had a family of eight come in. Now, he didn't tell me, but I'm thinking family of eight. They're probably islanders as well. And so this entire family comes walking in. And, uh, and he said that they come in and they're all standing at the back of the church because they didn't have a seat. And they're all sort of standing, they're looking around. They're first-time visitors. And he said he, the pastor's on stage and song service is going. He said he's looking and he said all of his disciples are there. They're in the service, man. They are in the zone. And no, this entire family, outstanding family, just there with nowhere to sit. He said, this 25-year-old young man, second service, turns around, sees them there, gets out of his chair, goes and gets the chairs and sets out two rows for them. All his top disciples are still there. <laughs> he said he was frustrated and blessed both at the same time. <laughs> Disciple. In whatever ministry you are appointed to, are you a hireling or do you have a servant's heart? What is necessary here? Stephen in the book of Acts, here is a powerful ministry. We need you to do something, Stephen. What is it? Can you go and take some food to the elderly? Can you go and wait upon? Can you serve some people? Here's a man, he is not a pastor. He was never a pastor. And he is looking, what else can I do? And he starts to pray for the sick and revival breaks out because a disciple was looking, what else can I do to minister here? The second thing that a disciple is, is a disciple is teachable or they have a teacher. By definition, a disciple is a student or an apprentice and every single student has a teacher. We know of Leonardo da Vinci. Most of us would be well aware of his paintings and he's well known for the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. But what is not so well known is that when he was 15 years old, his father took him to a noted sculptor and painter whose name was Andrea Verrocchio. And he took his son and he took him way, way far away from home down to Florence there in Italy and left him there for 10 years. I said, son, if you're going to become something and somebody in this life and in this field, in this arena, you need to have the best. And see, today we see the works of Leonardo da Vinci and the world stands in awe. But really, they are the fingerprints of an unknown man named Andrea Verrocchio. 
So often you see certain DNA in a man of God. You know, you hear him preach, you hear him pray, you see his life, whatever it may be, but you say, you know what, he's pastor such and such as disciple. And, and you, can, you can see something in there, but how many of the truth is that that is not automatic? That that doesn't happen merely because of association. I'm hanging around him, I'm being there, and so I see him. I'm, it doesn't happen only by association. That happens through failure. That happens through our mistakes, a disciple's mistake, and an open heart that will allow a pastor to speak into our life. I remember the first time that I perhaps actually had a revelation that my, I might have been a disciple. I've been in church for my entire life. I think I was probably saved for maybe 10 years. I was in song service. I was a song leader. I was a Bible study leader. I was involved in different bands and outreaches and different things. And I don't think, to be absolutely honest, that I was ever a disciple through that 10 years, if I've got to be honest. Until one outreach, Pastor Payne had not long been in Perth. And here is this, you know, this is this outreach going on. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's this crazy lady da- dancing down the front, but there were visitors everywhere. It was almost, it was kind of chaos. Got up and did the altar call and had about, I think it was eight or nine people respond and get saved. So I'm thinking, yeah, thank God, you know. And so Pastor Payne said, Glenn, come, come here for a second. So I'm thinking, you know, well done, you know, people saved and great. Come here. Let me help you with something. If your pastor says that to you, just put, put the books down there. Anyway. He says, um, what were you thinking? What was I thinking? I'm thinking, what was I thinking? And I'm, what, do you, what do you mean? He says, did you see the lady dancing down the front there? I'm like, well, well yeah, I just didn't want to... In- she wrecked your whole outreach. I, I, di- I didn't get it. She took away dominion and he said, uh, he said, let me help you with something else. He said, you know what? You said this and this and this and this in your altar call. He said, where did you get that from? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he said, because that's not the Bible. <laughs> that ain't the gospel. I'm surprised anybody got saved. I'm like, what? I'm still puzzled. I've got to be honest, I'm still a little bit, you know. <laughs> you know, I drove home that night feeling literally about that big. And I'm kind of processing this in my mind. And I begin to pray. And I said, Lord, I said I wanted to be a disciple. And I'm grateful that for the first time, somebody loved me enough to tell me the truth. Because I've done countless altar calls. I'm serious, man. Years worth of altar calls. And no one ever said anything. A disciple has to have a teachable spirit. Number three, a disciple is an extension of his pastor. Disciple is somebody who, 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 who faces circumstances of life and rather than thinking, you know what, they're a lone ranger and they're just going to somehow figure it all out by themselves, they come to the revelation where they ask themselves the question, what would my pastor do? If if he were here, if he was dealing with this, if he was in this situation, what would he do? Here is Elisha in our scripture. He has just witnessed his pastor's departure. He has just seen the miracle of the Jordan River parting and he comes to his first obstacle in his own ministry and the first thing out of his mouth is where is the Lord God of my master? What would my pastor do if he were here? See, some mistakenly think that it's just them and Jesus. It's a disciple only of Jesus Christ. But beloved, if calling and ministry was only a man and his God, we understand Elisha had his own relationship with God. And if that were the case, and it was only a man and his God, he would have simply said, where is the Lord my God? We see an account of this in the book of Judges, verse 618, because both of these men recognize there is a de- uh, my destiny has a connection here. It's connected to my headship. It's Judges 618, Gideon and his army of 300 are going to take on a vast army. And God tells Gideon, Gideon, if you're going to have success, you're going to have to have the men say, the sword of the Lord 
and of Gideon. Because a disciple is an extension, not just of God, but of his pastor. Paul said, you have asked for a pattern. Here is Paul, the quintessential disciple maker, and he said, follow me as I follow Christ. So if you're a disciple this morning, the question is, whose disciple are you? A man named Jack Hobbs is from the Beachborough Church, just a great brother in the church, fairly involved. Went to Indonesia on an impact team. Went and out into the villages in the Kampungs there and he, uh, he, he begins to uh, a witness to these people and there's a lady there limping and he has her sit down in a chair, as we know, as we've seen. Sits her in a chair, legs shorter than the other one. And begins to lead her in a prayer. You need to repent of, you need to forgive anybody. Yes, um, uh, you've been involved in witchcraft. Yes, pray this. There's some disciples there from the church. And they're watching and this woman gets powerfully healed. She's rejoicing and they're all rejoicing. Later on at fellowship that night, these disciples from the Indonesian church were there with Jack. And they said, you know what? Uh, one of them goes, you know what, brother, you've got a powerful touch of God upon your life. I saw that girl get healed today. That was powerful. You've got God all over you. You know what Jack's response was? He started laughing and he said, no. He said, you know what? He said, I was faking it. That's an interesting response. He said, I was faking it. He goes, I wasn't really faking it. I meant it. He said, but I just did exactly what I've seen my pastor do. The disciple. I mean, all this is good, but you know the greatest help a disciple can have is a relationship. Again, here are the origins of a tradesman and apprentice. This child would leave their own home. This was more than an, a job and an occupation. The apprentice would almost become a part of their master's family. They would be. They would become like a son. We live, let's be honest this morning, we live in a fatherless generation. And by God's design, a pastor is able to fulfill a part of that role. A pastor-disciple relationship, biblically, is very similar, um, uh, similar to that um, of a father and son relationship. In our scripture, in verse 12, here is Elisha's revelation of his master. He says, my father, my father... This word translates exactly as it sounds. This was how Elisha viewed Elijah. This was the depth of this relationship. The Apostle Paul again. Philemon 1 verse 10. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. Paul got Onesimus saved while in prison and began to disciple him and viewed him as a spiritual son. Paul said to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1 verse 2, to Timothy, a true son in the faith. Paul said to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 4 15, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Church, discipleship is not just information. You can get information on YouTube. And sometimes I wonder if that's not half the problem that at my assistant pastor is Andy Stanley. But you know, the truth is this morning that it's not a cold program. Are you just checking off a list? And are you just covering your bases? But in true discipleship, there is relationship. Leroy Imes, in his outstanding book, The Lost Art of Disciple Making, made a number of quotes. He said, like-minded, trustworthy, competent men are not made on a production line like automobiles in an assembly plant. He went on to say that disciples are not mass-produced. There is a relationship. You know what we see in the scripture? We see these two men that were incredibly close. They had to be separated. If we looked at verse 11, this chariot comes down, this supernatural moment, um, but they had to be separated before, uh, uh, before Elijah could be taken. There was a heart connection. And tragically, some don't get this. 
We can read about Gehazi, who was Elisha's disciple. When, Ge- when Naaman got healed uh, in 2 Kings chapter 5, um, uh, uh, the Bible says that Gehazi's greed gets the better of him. He goes after Naaman. He takes a gift, uh, lies. Um, he comes back. He hides that. He comes back in before his pastor. His pastor said, where did you go? He says, oh, I didn't go anywhere. And Elisha turns, 2 Kings 5, 26. Then he said to him, did not my heart go with you? When the man turned back from his chariot to meet you. Listen, there is a connection. There is a closeness. Verse 11 again. Then it happened as they continued on and talked. Here's Elisha was able to talk to his pastor. He's able to communicate face to face. Hallelujah. He's not hiding behind a text message or an email. But he's able to share his passions for destiny, his faith and his beliefs of what God has for his life. And he's able to share them with his spiritual father. These men were close. They had this relationship. You know, another thing that I see in this scripture is that while they were close, what we see in this example is that a large portion of this relationship was on the disciple. These two powerful prophets were close. But the pursuit of this relationship, in many ways, was up to Elisha. Over and over again, what did Elijah say? You need to stay here and know I am with you, I am following. The distractions come, the sons of the prophets, and he's telling them, Be quiet. They're telling them, be quiet. You're not going to hold me back from this. Then the double portion request. If you want this, you're going to have to stay close. Because the relationship was up to, in many respects, up to Elisha. In the book of uh, 2 Kings in chapter 6, there's another example of this. this. In this day and age, there was a college of the sons of the prophets This is where they would go, university, if you will. Um, They would stay so they could be close to the prophets. Um, And in this case, the prophet was the prophet Elisha. Verse 1 and 2 of 2 Kings 6, The sons of the prophet said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and, 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 and let every man take a beam from there. Let us make there a place where we may live. And he answered, Go. Then one of them said, Please Come with us. And he answered, I will go. And so he went with them. Listen, if they didn't ask, Elisha probably would not have gone. Most people with people skills realize it's kind of socially unacceptable to invite yourself. To just sort of barge your way, you know, I'm going to fill you up with discipleship. That's kind of, it, that's manipulation. That's control. Jesus on the Emmaus Road, the Bible says he indicated he would have gone further, but they asked him to stay. Jesus walking on the water, the Bible says, and he would have passed them by, but they cried out. And so many times, it is on the disciples. I know this is the, this is the truth with me. There are so many times that if my pastor calls me, oh, something's up. He's not ringing to have a chat. It's can you go somewhere in the world and leave your entire life behind or it's I've got a problem, can you help me with it? But if there's relationship, that's on me. Why would that be true? Because a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And until a disciple, till I, until you and I come to this point where we recognize I need something here. There is something that I can latch onto and my pastor is the one that has it. Discipleship can only become truly effective when a man begins to come, come and, and in relationship ask because church, we want to take the land. But will you be a disciple first? A man named Eben Brene is out of the Beachboro Church and I believe this is part of his uh, story when he was just five weeks saved he heard a sermon about discipleship and he went to his pastor and said I want to be a disciple just five weeks on from his conversion a few months after that there was a sermon about outreach 
and he's, he went to his pastor and said, I, I'd love to do an outreach, and, and, and how do I do one? How do I set it up? What do I say? How do I do an altar call? This guy is as fresh as, uh, and so one of the, uh, they sat him down and said, okay, listen, come and have a look at an outreach. And he went along, saw the general set up. This is what you've got to say in your altar call. Gave him a bit of a, a guideline. Unbeknownst to them, he had written the whole thing down. And so he went home, he organized that, went and did the outreach, stood up to the altar call. Said, hi, bow your heads, close your eyes. You're here, you're in sin, you're going to go to hell. You need to, get, you need to get your heart right with God. Jesus died on the cross to forgive you. So lift your hand if you need. And 13 people got saved. Totally mechanical, doesn't understand charisma or preaching or <laughs> illustration or brand new. How was that possible? Because he had a relationship and because he asked. Elisha understood something here that his connection to destiny will come through his relationship with his pastor. And without that, there was something valuable, incredibly valuable, that was going to be missing. Let me close by talking about the blessing on the disciple. Because obviously we recognize, and every person that is a disciple recognizes that, you know, we, we open our heart. We open our, we expose our lives many times. But there's a profound blessing on the disciple. We see this in our scripture, and I want you to think about this journey with me. We read just the last part of that journey. But verse 1 through 5 has another portion of this um, because each stop that there was um, that's, that's named in this text, um, every disciple, we can relate to these places. Verse 1 and 2 of our, of, of our text in, in 2 Kings chapter 2, the Bible says, When the Lord was about to take Elijah, Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. The first stop in this man's journey was Gilgal. We could ask the question this morning, what does Gilgal represent? We read about Gilgal in Joshua chapter 5. The Bible says, then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Gilgal actually means rolled away. And, or this morning, we could say this is a picture of the removal of the disgrace of sin. This is a picture of salvation. This is a picture of conversion. And in the scripture, what we read is that there is actually a temptation that some can come and they can get born again. And let's be honest, what a glorious place it is when the burden of our sin and our guilt rolls away. But the possibility is that some get saved and there is a blessing there, but somewhere in their spirit, they say, thank God, but this is far enough. And they're happy to just stop at that place. Whereas Elisha had the spirit and the attitude and the demeanor, no way, I'm following you all the way. Verse 2 and 4, so they went down to Bethel. And Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Second stop here was Bethel. Bethel represents the house of God. Bethel represents the presence of God. Jacob, in a, he had a dream about the ladder reaching to heaven. And remember that story. What did he say? This is none other than the house of God. How awesome is this place? David in the psalm said, One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And the possibility for some is they get saved. And thank God they come into the house of God. They sense the presence of God and what a blessed place it is. And there can be such a satisfaction right at that point to remain in that state. Last year again, I'm not going to stop and be comfortable, I want to go further. Verse 5 and 6, they come to Jericho. How many know what Jericho represents this morning? How many remember the story of Jericho? Thank God. 
Amen. Elisha said, stay here for the Lord has sent me on. And he said, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Jericho represents destruction of the enemy. It represents an overthrow of supernatural proportions. It represents a supernatural breakthrough and falling walls and dominion by an absolute strategy of God and a moving of the Spirit of God. And again, it is possible to find enough personal satisfaction, salvation, the presence of God, the house of God, supernatural breakthrough, and then grow comfortable and stay in that place. And if I've got to be really transparent this morning, I stayed in that place for a long, long time. And can I be honest with you, as I move along now, go along a little bit in years, this is one of the regrets of my life. Young disciples, don't make the same mistake. Don't grow comfortable just because you get a little breakthrough or God is moving. Verse 7 and 8, the two of them stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, struck the water, and it was divided this way and that. And the two of them crossed over on dry ground. On one side of the Jordan, if you remember back to the children of Israel going into the promised land, on one side was safety, on the other side were giants to be conquered and crossing that Jordan represented the fruition of destiny. Every time the temptation to stop and stay in a comfortable place, Elisha said, no, I am following my pastor all the way to my destiny. You know, I don't know that we ever stop being a disciple but one thing that I do know is that God is involved in this and that there is a supernatural dimension and there is a mantle that is to be passed on, to be, to be handed and taken, father to son. And if you want to pick up the mantle, you have to be there. How many disciples, the Bible says 50 of them, stood and watched and one crossed over? 50 of them maybe could have had some resemblance of the supernatural in their lives. One of them picked up the mantle. And I submit to you this morning, saints, that our pastors, our leaders, our spiritual fathers, their hearts burn with a passion to pass on the mantle for the deliverance of the world in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Elliot preached about the long haul. But the question this morning how far will you go? How far are you prepared to go? What price are you prepared to pay? We live in the West. You're going to grow comfortable? Will you sell out again? Because a double portion is available from God. The day came that this man, the Bible says, and he crossed over. There was a marking point here of the beginning of his own ministry and his own destiny and it began with him doing exactly what his pastor had done. In our scripture, Elisha asks for a double portion. You know the blessing here? Only a son can lay claim to a double portion. You consider yourself a disciple and make sure you're a son. Because only a, double, only a son can lay claim to a double portion. His commentators believe that Elisha is pointing to Deuteronomy 21 verse 17. It says, But he shall acknowledge the firstborn son by giving him a double portion of all that he has. Elisha is not drawing upon some ethereal, spiritual, random thing that is out there. No, he's actually talking about something very specific about being the oldest spiritual son and receiving a double portion of a spiritual inheritance. I believe that's available to every son, every daughter, every person who would claim that this morning that they're a disciple. For the record, Elijah did 14 major miracles. Elisha did 28. And here is a profound reality that the ability to put a spirit upon a man is in a spiritual realm. That belongs to God and it points to the fact that God is involved in this. And I wonder this morning if we could briefly do the math here. Because a double portion was on this man. What was available to Elisha's disciple? Should he seek it as a son and should he ask for it? 
was another double portion. What was available to him was four times the original. You know, some here this morning. How are we going to take the world for Jesus? Some here this morning, you're fifth generation, maybe more. Pastor Mitchell, let's just use Footscray as an example. Lynn Litton, Pastor Daryl Elliott. Your pastor, and now you. If my math is correct, that, is, that you know, and I know this is just the clinical math here, and God is a big God, but that effectively tells me there are 16 times the possibility of what is available for you. That you can do far more that, than our pastors have ever done because of the Spirit of God and because of the need of the hour uh, and because of the brokenness of our world uh, and because of all that God is wanting to do in the earth. There is a divine inheritance that is available for you and I if we would cry out for it. If you would choose this morning to yield your life to your past, to see a father has the ability and the right, to, the sole right to bring discipline. To say no. And I've been told no plenty of times, and I thank God because just like my sons, I have to say no from time to time, and it saves them pain. And my pastor is able to save me from a lifetime of hurt because I view him as a spiritual father. We're well able to take the land for Jesus Christ. Let me close this morning. You know, recently, I was thinking about going full time, and I I mentioned that in my uh, 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 report last night. I was thinking about this, and I was actually thinking, to be honest, around, you know, I'm, still, I'm looking at, you know, I'm, I've got 25 million children, and so I'm thinking about, you know, uh, uh, money and family and housing and all these different things, and I've got to, had a good job and, and all of this. And so I'm thinking this through, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe, you know, November, I guess, maybe by Christmas time, uh, it may work out. And so I'm discussing the timing of that, with my pastor. And I'm thinking a few more months and he just said a, just a couple of things from a pastoral perspective that effectively was the nudge over the edge. The next work day, we'd made a decision and handed our notice in. Now let me add and let me just throw this out there for the offering this evening. In succession with that, we actually hadn't planned on doing this, but we, a few weeks out of uh, this conference, we took a pledge. So I'm standing there. God didn't speak to me, any major figure, but I did feel in my spirit, God, you know what? Um, I want to invest. And so we're going to do this, and we're going to bring this from the Thomastown Church, um, and uh, we're going to give that on Monday night and make sure we just cover our entire conference costs and be a blessing to the leadership church here. We took a pledge for that. I didn't know this. My wife was sitting in the congregation and she made a pledge as well. And I'm thinking, oh, now it's, now it's kind of getting heavy. But you know what? We said, you know what? We're going to do this. We believe in this. We're going to do this. You know, in two weeks, we gave that pledge and we received back. As so often is the case, let me tell you how much we received back. I'm not telling you the amount of money, but 1000 500%. I wish I gave more. See, what transpired from that conversation with my pastor was the single greatest succession of supernatural breakthrough that I've ever seen in my life. I've been saved for 15 thereabouts years. Uh, the, the, the greatest level of blessing that I've ever seen in my life. But you know what? I nearly missed it. Here is God is about to pour out a, a blessing, an absolute a dimension of God that I have never seen before. And I nearly missed it. But it wasn't. And the reason it wasn't is because I have a pastor that I'm in relationship with, yielded to, that I could call thank God, and have a heart-to-heart, -heart, straight-up conversation with and be told, no, don't wait. Why would you wait? Launch in. So we're well able to take the land, church, and we believe that this morning. I believe that we believe that. But the question this morning is, who is your pastor? Can he speak into your life? Is your heart open? 
for him to be able to disciple, teach, and that we could learn from. Because discipleship is a profound key. And I believe in these last days is the key. You and I winning the world for Jesus Christ. I mean, that's all that I have this morning. Let's give God praise, our brother. Thank you.